Thank you to both the first speakers. Many interesting points and important points were made as today's topic is a very serious one and it deals with the fundamental concept of God and our belief system. So now we're gonna have the question and answer session and I'm sorry, actually the second mic is not working. That's why we're not gonna have any direct Q and A session. So we're gonna, I'm gonna read out the question that has been written by the, by all of you guys here. So the first question is for Joe. Are you able to give um, in the logical and historic, uh, give the logical and historical definition, what? Theological. theological, okay. Theological and historical definition of Trinity. Can you please come to the podium and answer that? Yeah. Uh, the way I've, um, as I say, I focused uh, on something that is uh, right in the, uh, in the Bible, in the Torah, um, because people say a lot of things, but I always like to, uh, that was, I took science in school, and uh, I always strived so I can think for myself. Um, the school gives you the tools, the tools of reason, and so I tried uh, through uh, the internet and researching, talking to people, etc., professors, and uh, and uh, what has been revealed to me uh, um, to try to understand uh, this uh, this Bible that has been given, handed down to us uh, at such a great price. Um, I mean, uh, you know, we're going back now. Uh, what uh, for? close to 4,000 years, 3,500 from Moses, perhaps. Um, I'm not a scholar of the Bible, um, so I just, um, I did just focused on, uh, on some of these uh, important points here. And uh, um, no, I cannot give you uh, the theological definition of uh, Trinity, sorry. Well, I don't, <laughs> I don't think I can give you either. I just presented to you. I, I, what I like to do is to empower you to um, try to understand it yourself. See what you can make of it. I mean, people say a lot of things. And we know that there are, who should we believe? Should we believe uh, this uh, Torah? Or should we believe what people say? I mean, you know, today, you just go on the internet, thousands and thousands of people. And so at some point, like Adam said, she made me do it. So we're trying to blame others now. So when we're in front of the presence of God, he's going to say, well, what about you? There was a book. Did you study it? Did you take some time? And I'm here always. Why didn't you ask me? I would have helped you. And I per personally had an experience like that where I was given a, this flash of light and I understood a, a paradox as clear as daylight. I don't know how that happened, but it happened. So I had my personal experience. When you ask God for something, he will give it to you. Just like he'll give you the sight to see the color red. And no words, no amount of words to a blind man can describe the color red. Thank you. The next question is for Dr. Shabir. Um, is it Allah's will for everyone to be saved? Uh, and there is an ayah quoted in Quran, um, chapter 10, verse 99 to 100, says, says it isn't his will. Yeah, someone quoted that. And the Bible says he wants everyone to be saved, John 3, something like that. So it's at, at chapter 10, verse number 90. Uh, 9 to 100. That's the one. Um, so, chapter 10. So, it says, 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 So, 
وما كان لنفس أن تموت إلا بإذن الله أن تؤمن إلا بإذن الله ويجعل الرجس على الذين لا يعقلون Okay, so uh, the, the questioner then is asking, let me translate the passages. Uh, if there had been, uh, if, it, if, it had, if thy Lord willed, all who are in the earth would have believed together. Wouldst thou, Muhammad, compel men until they are believers? It, it is not for any soul to believe, save by the permission of Allah. He hath set on cleanness upon those who have no sense. So now, how does that compare with uh, the idea that it is the will of God for everyone to be saved? Uh, now, the way I would understand this passage in the Quran is that God has created uh, people and given them the basic uh, predisp predisposition uh, towards good and evil and the rationality to choose between good and evil. And then it's up to people to choose. Uh, if they choose to go towards the evil side, the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, has no authority to compel those people towards good. He has to leave them. That's their God-given freedom to choose error. And if it had been the will of God, he would have fixed everyone to be on the right path. So the, the, their, their freedom of choice would be blocked. They would not be able to choose evil. They would all be compelled to choose what is right. If God wanted everybody to be on the right path, uh, to that extent, then he could block their choice towards evil. But it's not his will. It is his will to leave people free to choose what is right. But he desires for them to choose what is right. But he's not going to impose that desire on people. It's like we don't desire somebody to be on the street begging. We would rather provide a shelter for him, provide food, a warm bath, and so on. But if somebody chooses to be on the street, the law of this country won't just pick him up off the street and force him to be in a shelter. You see? So, uh, yeah, we desire for this guy to be in a shelter. Uh, and, and we'll give him some money and let him have a nice, decent living. But if he desires to be on the street, uh, we can only help him to the extent that we can where he is. And this is the way that God has uh, left us. As for the Bible's um, 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 position on whether God wants everyone to be saved or not, uh, this obviously is something that Christians have had different opinions about uh, between Arminians and, and, and Calvinists. And uh, perhaps Joe might want to shed some uh, light on that. Thank you all. I like to give a little, I, I like analogies. Say. Uh, one a little example is how can it be, you know, that God, God wills one thing and yet he gives us the freedom. I look at gravity. Let's say gravity is the will of God that we should stay on the ground. But we can also choose to climb up on a ladder and fall. <laughs> so that's a little example. Thank you. The next question is for Joe. Um, how can creator and creation be equal? And there is another question. Did Jesus, peace be upon him, ever mention in his life that he is son of God? If so, where it is mentioned in the Old Testament Bible? Or the New Testament one, yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, when you read it, uh, you know, you can search now. Today we're lucky we have these uh, search engines. Um, the question is, uh, I think we can agree on that uh, Jesus was sentenced to go to the cross. But why? What did he do? What, for what reason? Well, uh, a couple of reasons were, one, he, um, he worked on, he healed someone on a Sabbath. And, of course, uh, that is that is wrong for, uh, for the uh, Jewish uh, law to, uh, to do any work on a Sabbath. Uh, so that was one. But then um, Jesus also says uh, that uh, he made his father, uh, God his father. Um, and of course, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, also not acceptable in the uh, Jewish uh, law. And, uh, and then uh, when, uh, now, Jesus was, uh, was presented in front of three judicial systems. Uh, the way I understand it, it was uh, King Herod, and uh, nothing happened there. King Herod was uh, pleased to see him, uh, but he did nothing. 
Uh, then he, he was presented in front of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, and he said, I find nothing wrong in this man. You know, he's, so he washed his hands. And then he was presented in front, of course, the Jewish uh, um, high priest, uh, priestly uh, people that um, they, I mean, they, can't, they can't sentence someone to, to the cross uh, or to die uh, unless there's a reason. And so they, they asked Jesus, tell us, who are you? And of course, uh, Jesus uh, always gives these uh, ve uh, veiled answers. And uh, he made a statement that uh, he said, he quotes now from the bo book of Daniels. Uh, he said, uh, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Father, I think he said, and coming in the clouds. And when he said that, uh, the high priest ripped his clothes apart, and uh, he said, you heard him, he blasphemed him. Now, what on earth was a blasphemy here? And he said, and he deserves to die. Okay, what was a blasphemy? The blasphemy was that Jesus made himself equal to God. And um, a lot of people don't understand it because it's, uh, you know, that's the way things are. Things are not simple. You've got to understand practically every word and, um, and uh, the way the laws were and everything to understand what. Now, now it's interesting, too, that Jesus uh, didn't speak in the present tense. He spoke in the future tense. Because I know my brothers, uh, uh, Muslims, are waiting for Jesus to come back. Now, what if what he said was true? Now, can you imagine they just sent someone to die for a future statement that he made, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Father coming in the clouds in the future. So, so uh, and then uh, also Jesus, when, when the three magi from, from the east, uh, because uh, the Jewish people were taken into Babylon as slaves because they disappointed God, and God, even though Solomon built this great temple, but the prophets always warned, you have moved away from God. And he warned them, he says, I'm gonna send you a people here from the east who have no fear of mothers with expectant, expectant mothers, and old people are young. And, and they did not heed the prophet's words, and so people from Iraq uh, went, and they destroyed the, the, the Jewish temple, killed everyone, uh, almost like didn't, didn't care, and took some of the healthier people, I guess, to, uh, to Babylon for I think it was 40 years, and uh, as a slaves again. And um, uh, so th while these Jewish people were in Iraq, they still read the Torah, they still, they were learned people, and some of, we believe that some of these three wise men were actually Jews who were in Iraq and they went, but they were waiting for this Messiah because the Jewish people even today are waiting for a Messiah. And uh, we believe he has already come, but he has been veiled and he'll come again, but in power. And uh, very complex because you have to read it when you read the book of Isaiah, uh, the, the, the suffering servant, etc. Nothing here is easy and, and I'm not an expert at it. I'm just bits and pieces here. But when they went, they finally went, uh, they talked to Herod, and Herod said, yeah, let me know where this guy's gonna be born. Uh, I would like to meet him, you know, but meanwhile, he wanted to kill them. Uh, so he, he ended up killing every, every child of two years and, and younger, and, 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 but God warned the family that they went to Egypt, and uh, et cetera, to, to save their life. But, but the point here is when the three Magi went to visit Jesus, it says they worshiped him. As a child, they worshiped them, and they brought him gold. Gold is a, a gift given to kings. Incense is a gift given to God, and myrrh is for someone who's gonna, who dies. And so they give him these three gifts. So that, to me, it's symbolic. And then after Jesus resurrected, after three days, it says they worship him. If you can read, many places it says worshiped him. Worshiped him. Uh, I don't know if that answers a little bit, uh, that, that Jesus is sort of, Yes, he made himself equal to God, and that's why he was sent to the cross. And yes, they worshiped him before, while he was born, and, and after he resurrected. Thank you. Thank you, Joey, for that answer. 
So now this is for Dr. Shabir. Uh, do Muslims consider belief in the Trinity as a form of idolatry? The, the Quran um, advises um, uh, people of the book, addressing them directly, Ya Ahlul Kitab, or people of the book, um, and this Muslims take to be a reference to uh, Jews and Christians, depending on context. In this uh, case, it looks like it's an address to Christians, and says to them, La uh, taghlu fi dinikum. Do not exaggerate things in, in your religion, and uh, do not say about God except that which is true. And um, it uh, says that uh, you should not say thalasa, do not say three. Intahu. Khairallakum, a disease, that would be better for you. So how to explain this? Uh, some uh, Muslim commentators and translators would say, do not say Trinity, uh, or, or do not say, it literally it says, do not say three. La takulu thalatha. And then in another passage it says, laqad kafara ladina qalu inna allaha thalithu thalatha. Those uh, disbelieve who say that God is a third of three. Now, to clarify, our Christian friends do not say that, that God is a third of, of, of three. Uh, but uh, as Sidney Griffith pointed out in his book, The Bible in Arabic, uh, the Quran is um, here calling attention to the way in which people said things and using their words against them. Uh, so uh, they were referring to Jesus as something in Syriac that resembled the Arabic uh, statement Thalith, or third. Uh, so the Quran is in a way um, criticizing that belief and caricaturing that, that belief. Um, of course, we don't prove a thing by caricature, uh, but uh, the, the Quran is trying to use uh, various rhetorical devices uh, to get the people at the time to understand that there is only one God and to see that by promoting Jesus as God, uh, they have made the faith uh, difficult for Muslims to understand, but also difficult for themselves to understand and to explain. Um, you notice that earlier, Joe, you remember you said that uh, the whole is equal to, to, to its parts, right? Uh, to the sum of the parts. To the sum of its parts, yes. So if we think about that, which is a basic proposition, the whole being equal to the sum of its parts, so if you have the Holy Spirit being God, the Father being God, and the Son being God, then the whole must be equal to the sum of the three. Uh, but obviously, you know, every Christian will say that there is only one God, and this is where they lose Muslims. Uh, so the, the Quranic perspective is that uh, this is not a proper way of speaking about God. And in fact, uh, Muslims who are sparked in, uh, whose interest is sparked by, Muslims whose interests are sparked by this Quranic narrative would be interested in, in going to the Bible and see, does the word Trinity exist in the Bible anywhere? Is there a verse in the Bible which says that there are three gods or, or three persons in the one divine uh, substance, or sharing the one divine substance, or something to this effect? And uh, I, I have to confess that as a Muslim, I haven't found any. Uh, but uh, Joe maybe knows something that he can tell us about that will indicate that uh, there, in the Bible, that there are three persons in the Godhead. Of course, there are passages which might give the impression that uh, it looks like Jesus is here claiming to be God uh, or something like this. But the way a Muslim would look at that is to say there must be some interpretation that harmonizes that with the whole Bible, so that the whole Bible teaches the one simple, plain message that there is only one God, and that is the same message that is repeated in the Quran. And then once you know that that's an overriding and basic fact and teaching, you, you should not interpret other passages to go contrary to that teaching. Uh, like, for example, you know me to be a Muslim, right? So uh, you know that um, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that Jesus is God. But let's say you walked in halfway during the lecture, and I was saying that Christians say Jesus is God. But you only heard the last part. You only heard me say Jesus is God. Now, if you run away telling other people, you know, Shabir Ali was in that lecture and he said Jesus is God, then you've obviously run away with the wrong idea because you only heard half of the statement, right? But if you know the person who is speaking, 
then you will know that he could not have meant that himself. Even though you didn't hear the whole thing, uh, if somebody reported that to you, you will say, well, no, I mean, no, Shabir Ali, he's not going to say that. Maybe he was just quoting the Christians. So sometimes when Jesus speaks as a prophet, maybe he's just quoting God. Uh, some of the prophets speaking on behalf of God, they start with the words of God without saying God says. But you know that they're telling you the word of God. And that's in the Quran as well. Sometimes the word of God uh, and the speech of God is being broadcast. And the Prophet Muhammad does not preface it by saying, let me tell you this is what your Lord says. So we have to distinguish between what God says and what the Prophet is saying. And what the Prophet could mean in a specific context. And then we have to put that against uh, the rest of what he's saying as well. Uh, are there any passages in which he clearly indicates that he wouldn't be God and he couldn't be God and so on. So th these are the reasons that we have this kind of discussion so that we can share perspectives because if we only see things from one direction all of the time, we might be missing the other perspective and I'm glad we're having a discussion like this and thank you for whoever asked this question. The next question is for Joey. Um, in Christianity and Islam, we know that Almighty God is all-powerful and can do, perform anything he wishes, um, like the birth of Jesus. My question is, if he is that powerful and cannot he forgive the sins of humanity without sacrificing his only begotten son? Yeah. Sorry, could you repeat the question? So the thing is, like, you want to know, like, whether um, the sin can be forgiven without, like, sacrificing the son. Can he not forgive the sin of the people without sacrificing the son? That's what he wants to say. Like, he wants to know. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, it, that's a difficult question for me. I don't really know the answer. I can give a little bit... Uh, that he is, they say he is a God of, of, of uh, mercy and, uh, and also of justice. And, um, and how do you reconcile these two? So if, when we sin, uh, we hurt, we sin at first and foremost, I think, against God. And then we also sin against the person that we hurt. And... Um, how can we pay that price? Uh, some people could say, would say, well, forgive that person, but some people says, no, I, I, just like in the real world, and I, and I think God has used this world as an example of the spiritual world. Uh, this is sort of, in a way, teaching us, because when the Jewish people, like when I read the Old Testament, when King David sinned, and what was his sin? His sin was he, he numbered his people, the soldiers, and he wasn't supposed to do that. How many people died, think of that, because of one sin that King David did? Can anybody tell me how many people God uh, killed? And that was God himself killed them. 70,000. So, um, see, I think, I think God is teaching us uh, through many various examples. So I don't want to make up my story. That's why I... I I would like everyone to, to, to read things for yourselves. Forget about what I say or other people say. Ask God and get that, those Bible, those books, and, and do some work. And, uh, and God, I'm sure, will help. Um, I have, an, uh, in regards to the Holy Trinity, um, uh, this is, uh, I don't, uh, these cherubims uh, that were in front of the garden, I don't know if you're aware, they had four faces. And inside the Holy of Holies, uh, on top of the Ark of the Covenant, there were the cherubims, and these have four faces. And, and also, by, God wanted them to embroider the face of the cherubim on the walls. Now, it's interesting, the sequence of the faces. The cherubim had, a, on the left, the face of an ox. On the right, so if you looked at me on the right, you would see a lion. If you looked at me from the top, you would see a bird. And if you looked at me in the face front, you would see the fa a human face. So 
from the way I kind of made an hypothesis, and the hypothesis is that the closer you and I are to God, the more we tend to resemble God. Because when Moses was close to God, his face glowed. The more we move away from God, like sinners, the, more, the less we resemble God. Now, for me, these cherubims are the closest beings to God. And you can read it for yourself. The description is very hard. I've read it a number of times, and I really can't figure it out. Uh, very complex. Um, and um, so I said to myself, what is the significance of these four faces? And so the hypothesis is that perhaps because God said no one, even Moses, could not see God's face. He says, anyone who sees my face dies. No one can see my face and live. And so he, even Moses, could only see the back of, Jesus, of God. And, of course, it was a human shape um, uh, because he, the way he dis God describes his form. But, but so I said, perhaps then these faces, the four faces of the cherubims, is actually a reflection of God. Let's say when you look at somebody in the water, you sort of see a glimpse of what that entity is. And the four faces, so if you look at it, the ox is a symbol of God in the Old Testament. It was a symbol in the ancient Hebrew hieroglyphics. It was a symbol of power or of God. And the, the, the lion is a symbol for the Lion of Judah. And Jesus is from is the Lion of Judah. And the Holy Spirit, which God gave the Spirit to Moses, there's many examples when he took a portion of the Spirit of Moses and he gave to the 70 elders to help him, they began to prophesy. And, and so a symbol of the Spirit uh, on top. And then God, a trinity, one in three, like a triangle, took on a fourth face in time, a human face. So this parallels uh, a statement in the book of Revelation which says, I am the Alpha, that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Now, I went to this uh, Greek, uh, uh, Greek town, and I asked them, tell me, how do you write the Alpha? And so this is a symbol of uh, how you write, how the Alpha is written. It's, uh, it's an A, capital A. Uh, and so I put uh, on the left the Father, on the right the Son, and in between the Holy Spirit. And then the Omega is a profile of the face of a person. If you put the eyes and the, and the uh, nose, it looks like a person. So in a sense what he's saying, I'm both God and man. And that connects with the cherubim's. That's, that's why that symbolism here is a little bit encrypted, but to figure it out, you have to know a lot of things, even ancient Hebrew hieroglyphics and <laughs> Hebrew. <laughs> so uh, it's, I don't know if that explained it. <laughs> The next question is to Dr. Shabir. Um, why was Jesus, Jesus born a virgin according to the Quran? Why can't Jesus forgive sins according to the Quran? Oh, yeah. These two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, did the questioner think that Jesus can forgive sins or, or cannot forgive sins? Cannot, okay, I see. Uh, so, uh, first of all, in the Quranic um, narrative about the virgin birth, we've already mentioned that when Mary says, uh, how can I have a child when no mortal has touched me? The angel replied, uh, so it will be. When God decides a thing, he only says uh, to it be and, and it becomes. So uh, God created Jesus according to the Quran. A, a passage in the Quran in the third chapter says, Who is the one who shaped you in the wombs of your mothers the way he wants? And um, it, our Christian friends do agree that Jesus was born of a woman. So uh, while he was in the womb, from a Muslim perspective, it was God who was shaping him uh, into the wholesome person that he will become. So from the from Muslim understanding, the virgin birth itself is not a proof of Jesus' divinity. 
Let me ask, add here for Muslims who might be puzzled about this, that uh, uh, Christians also do not uh, generally think, at least Christian, the the Christian theologians, do not generally think that the virgin birth is a proof of Jesus' divinity. Uh, because according to, to them, uh, the Trinity means that uh, there has been from all eternity three uh, persons in the one Godhead, um, uh, three persons who are co-eternal and co-equal. They always existed and always will exist. Uh, so uh, Jesus, obviously, we know, was born some 2,000 years ago. Uh, we're now in the year 20. 18, and he was probably born somewhere between 8 BC and 4 BC during the reign of the King Herod. So 218 plus 4, about 222 years ago, uh, Jesus was born. But if he is God, according to Christian theologians, he was always God for, from all eternity. Uh, so the, if he was always God from all eternity as a spirit being, and now he wants to come here on earth as flesh and blood, then, you know, he can come down like a rise on the earth, maybe like Superman came from Krypton uh, or something like that. It doesn't have to be born of a human mother here. So being born of a human mother here is not a proof of his divinity. From a Muslim perspective, uh, this uh, is a proof of God's power to create in a wide variety of ways. And having said that, I, I want to make allowance also for the fact that uh, people are different. Some people uh, are more likely to accept what we call a stark miracle, and some people are more likely to accept what is called a subtle miracle. Uh, so by a stark miracle, I mean like here in your face, something is obviously done here, and there's no natural explanation for it, and we have to say God did it, right? A subtle miracle is one for which one can give a natural explanation, but the believer sees that God has done this. Like let's say, you know, somebody was in a coma and uh, that person awakens after we have made a lot of fervent prayers. So the believers will say, we prayed to God and God answered our prayers. This person came back, you know, from the dead almost. Um, but if we ask the doctors, the doctors will say, well, there's a medical explanation for this. We don't quite know what the medical explanation is, but there's a medical explanation and we will try hard to find this so that we can know in the future how we ourselves can awaken comatose patients. So uh, believers now do not need to deny that there is a natural explanation for this. Like we don't have to say, no, you doctors don't know what you're talking about. Don't look for any natural explanations. God did it and that's the end of the matter. So uh, the, for many believers, uh, a miracle can be a subtle one. Maybe there's a natural explanation, but that doesn't stop us from saying that God did it. And that doesn't pray, stop us from praying to God and asking him to do it. So uh, some, uh, an event like this I call a subtle miracle. And a stark miracle will be something that seems to be absolutely impossible given the laws of science, and, and it still happens. And some people uh, would, would be inclined to believe that, and some other people will say, though I'm a believer, I don't think it happened like that. Maybe there's an explanation that we didn't find yet, and maybe we need to probe a little bit more to find out how did anyone say it is like that. So in what I explain, I know that I'm speaking to the generality of people, and not everyone, Christian and Muslim, will accept that Jesus was born of a virgin. In fact, many Muslims will be surprised to find that many Christians today do not think that Mary was a virgin when she conceived of Jesus. Many Christians think that there must have been some natural explanation that is not given in the text. And uh, in the Quran as well, uh, when we read what is stated, basically it follows the biblical story, especially the gospel according to Luke. And one would presume that what the Quran means is that uh, Mary was never touched by a human being and she conceived of a child in this state of affairs. Uh, but, but if you look at specifically what the Quran says, uh, one who is not inclined to believe in what we call a stark miracle of this kind um, would find a leeway. Uh, so you might say, for example, that, okay, the angel came to Mary and said uh, to her, I'm giving you glad tidings of a child to be born, uh, meaning from you, and she says, well, how can I have a child when no mortal has touched me? One who wants to look for a natural explanation and does not like to accept a stark miracle can have a leeway at this point by saying, uh, when Mary said this, she was probably only about 12 years old. 
And if you say to a 12-year-old girl in that traditional society that you're going to have a baby, then don't be surprised if she asks you, how could this be possible? I'm not even married. So uh, the, a similar response is what we find from Mary here. How can I have a child when no mortal has touched me? It doesn't mean necessarily, one might say, that in this present state of affairs, you will have a child. It means you will get married and you will have a child in the future. So uh, one might say this is a possibility. So I just wanted to leave that uh, clear so that one knows. The traditional Muslim belief is that Jesus was born of a virgin. But many Muslims today do not uh, embrace all traditional Muslim beliefs, and some find a belief in a stark miracle like this to be difficult to accept. And so I wanted you to know that that's a possibility. If a Muslim comes up, it comes up to me and says, well, I don't think that Ma Mary was a virgin at the time of giving birth. She was a virgin at the time when she got the announcement. Uh, I would say, okay, it looks like you're interpreting the Quran at a very deep level. And uh, it's not my interpretation, but uh, I, we can allow for that within a Muslim context. Now, as for Jesus not forgiving sins in the Quran, the Quran actually shows that he is sinless. Uh, this has become a general belief uh, of Muslims about prophets more, more generally, that prophets are sinless. But it is interesting that in the case of Jesus, no sin is uh, mentioned uh, in, in connection with him. Uh, to the extent that there is a hadith that says that on the day of judgment, people will go to their prophets and ask them, plead with God so he can start the judgment, at least so we know where we stand, because we, you know, we're in this situation and uh, we don't know where we stand. Ask God to start the judgment. And one prophet after another will recount, according to that hadith, something that they did that makes them now shy to go before God. And then they will come to Jesus. And, and Jesus will not mention any such thing. So there was nothing that is mentioned in Muslim tradition that shows that Jesus committed a sin on any occasion. Uh, and then eventually the uh, matter will be deferred to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, according to that hadith, who will then plead with God and God will start the judgment. But the important point I wanted to mention here is that in Islamic tradition it is not mentioned that Jesus sinned at all. Uh, it is even mentioned that there's a hadith that says that uh, when, when a child is born, Satan pokes the child. And that's why the child cries, uh, except Jesus and his mother. So that, that shows that you know, they are protected by God uh, from the touch of the Satan. And, and this shows the high position that Muslims hold Jesus and his, mere, uh, and his mother Mary in. Uh, but at the same time, we say that the prerogative to forgive sins is only with God. And it is possible that God may reveal to one of his servants, especially a prophet like Jesus, that God is forgiving that individual so that that prophet can announce the forgiveness to that individual. It doesn't mean that the prophet himself is forgiving the individual, but he is just simply announcing the forgiveness. Like we have, for example, in the ninth chapter of the Quran, uh, the story of three men who failed to rally to the call of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and they were ostracized until forgiveness was announced to, God, uh, to them by God through the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the Prophet is announcing their forgiveness, but he's not the one forgiving them. He relies on God for that forgiveness. In a similar way, Muslims would read a passage in the Gospels where it says that Jesus said to a man, your sins are forgiven. Uh, the narrative even continues to say that the people at the time praise God who has given such authority to men. Which means that even at the time, people understood that when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, it's not on his own authority, but it is an authority given to him by God to do this. And by extension, it is mentioned in the gospel according to uh, Matthew that Jesus also gave the authority to his disciples so that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And in John's gospel, it said if you forgive the sins of someone, that person will be forgiven. So that means the authority is being transferred from one person to another, but the ultimate authority comes from God. He is the one who has the authority to forgive sins, and that's why as Muslims we pray to God directly. Thank you. The next question is for Joe. Uh, where in the Bible Jesus has said, I'm God, worship me?
Thank you uh, for that uh, question. Uh, I think I answered it a little bit. Um, it, nothing, it's, everything is a little bit veiled, a little bit complex. Uh, Jesus doesn't come out and say things, uh, even to his own apostles. He does things, he, he showed them like during the transfiguration. He began to glow, brilliant. His father spoke and said, this is my beloved son. But then, then they saw a transfiguration. I've been, uh, by the way, I've been to the Holy Land on top of that mount where it, it, it took place. And apparently Moses and Elijah appeared with, uh, at the time Jesus transfigured. And, um, and then Jesus says to them, uh, don't tell anyone until later. And so things are a little, because uh, also another time when Jesus said, I have to go to Jerusalem and, uh, and die. And Peter says, oh no, Lord, don't, don't go there. They'll kill you. you know? And Jesus said, get, get behind me, Satan. Um, you know, you're talking like a, a human being. He says, how, how can these things take place? if I don't do the will of my Father. And so there's like a, some kind of a script that Jesus had to, under, to go through, and it had to be followed, that script. Like you can't, if he just said, I am God, and here's my power, then how is he gonna be sent to the cross? And so, uh, and so that's why Jesus said, uh, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Father coming in the clouds. And when the high priest heard that, in his understanding as a priest, he said, Jesus made himself equal to God. And he, it's a blasphemy, and he had to die for it. And, um, and so it's a little bit vague. Unfortunately, uh, Jesus doesn't come like that and say, although he goes a, right, a, a roundabout way in saying things. And uh, unfortunately, that's the way he wants it. So all of, you, all of us, including myself, have to struggle trying to dig a little bit, the, the meanings. Sorry, thank you. So this is our last question for today's Q&A session, and it's for Dr. Shabir. If Adam and Eve are forgiven, why are they and their children still on earth and not in paradise? For it was Adam who sinned, not us. Are we not paying for Adam's sin because we are still on earth? The best answer I can muster for this is to say that uh, from in my understanding of, of what happened, um, it, 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 I would say that it is God's plan for human beings to be on the earth and that initially Adam and Eve were placed in the garden uh, for their original lesson. So this was like kindergarten. And then, you know, you graduate from kindergarten, you go into the world. So Adam and Eve were like in kindergarten. They're, they're in a garden. And I'm saying kindergarten because humankind was in its infancy now. They have to be given the lessons which will equip them for going out into the world. And the lesson which they came out with is that there is a Satan who will try to tempt you, as Joe said. Satan will try to tempt you. Uh, and, but you have to know how to deal with this Satan to avoid his temptation. So God can now say to us in the seventh chapter of the Quran, uh, o, o people, uh, children of Adam, uh, be aware of this Satan and don't let him trick you as he tricked your parents before you. Uh, so that's the original lesson. And if he does in fact trick you and you fall into sin, you know what to do now. You pray and you, you offer the dua or the supplication which Adam prayed, which we mentioned before, Rabbana Dalamna and Fusana, our Lord, we have wronged our souls. And you ask him for forgiveness. And then you're back up on your feet, you're ready to go again. So humankind was in the infancy, being placed in that situation where they can learn this lesson of life on how to go about and live in the world. And then they came out into the world and their children are obviously in the world uh, with that original lesson that our scripture can refer back to. So our being in the world is not a punishment uh, for the sin of Adam. This is part of the original plan of God. And notice in the Quran that it says in Surah Al-Baqarah, it's called Rabbuka lil malaikati inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. When God said, this is, the, this is at the beginning, before any sin is committed, God says to the angels, I am going to place a khalifa on earth. 
That's the original plan. God is going to place a successor on earth. So that means that humankind have to be on earth. That's God's plan. And uh, the, the story about Adam slipping from the garden, that's just the prelude to the unfolding of God's plan. Thank you very much. Guys, want to take one more question? Sure. Okay. So I don't know to whom this question is. Maybe either to Joe or Dr. Shabir. Uh, it says Psalm 49. Joe. For both. For both. Okay. Uh, Psalm 49:7. David says, "No one can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for them." Question: Who is right, David or Jesus Christ? The question is, who is right, David or Jesus? No one can read him the life of another or give to God a ransom for them. What was that second word? Redeem. 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 Yeah. No one can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for them. One, Dr. Shabir can answer. So the, the passage uh, reads in the New American uh, Bible, which also is the Bible that Joe has copied. Um, Psalm 49. Um, actually, in this Bible is verse number 8, and there's an asterisk uh, uh, probably indicating why, uh, why that is numbered 8 here. Um, but in any case, verse number 7 says, Of those who trust in their wealth and boast of their abundant riches. Um, so, so that's not connected to the question. The question is connected to verse number 8 here, which says, No man can ransom even a brother or pay to God his own ransom. The redemption of his soul is costly and he will pass away forever. Uh, will he live on forever then and never see the pit of corruption? Indeed, he will see that the wise die and the fool will perish together with the senseless and they leave their wealth to others. Uh, that's up to verse number 11. So uh, I, I think this is very clear. The questioner is very astute. And in fact, um, he has pointed here to a pertinent verse, which basically says that one does not give ransom for the other. Each person, as the Quran says, kullun bima kasaba rahin. Everyone is a like a prisoner to what he his his own hands have earned. His own deeds will imprison the person. So he has to free himself from his own misdeeds by doing what is right and asking God for forgiveness. We can add to this that Ezekiel chapter 18, the whole chapter is along the same theme, that you cannot uh, penalize the innocent person for the sake of the guilty one. And this, of course, is a Quranic teaching as well. Uh, so I would be interested, uh, as you are, to hear how Joe uh, will explain uh, this, uh, these verses in the light of Christian teaching. Thank you. Uh, well, my understanding uh, is um, actually this reinforces the point that Jesus can do that because he is both man and God. Because, uh, because we do not understand really the value of a soul. And, um, you know, we might, uh, we cannot. There's, um, I think even Jesus said, um, uh, what is it, um, what, what is the advantage of gaining the whole world? and losing your soul. And uh, yes, there's no price for it. Only God knows its value. And he's the only one who can ransom. We can forgive each other's, and he wants us to forgive each other's, uh, some of our in, 
uh, our uh, short shortcomings with with one another, uh, and he will uh, he will consider that. Because if we don't forgive others, uh, God said he's not going to forgive us either. But when we forgive others, then he'll consider that. And he says, well, you're, you did it for them, and I'll do it for you, more or less. Um, so actually, that reinforces a point that God had to be, uh, that Jesus is God, because he is that one um, who can forgive sins. And which is interesting, too, I like to point out that before Jesus forgive uh, when he gave the authority to forgive sin, he he breathed onto them and says, receive the Holy Ghost. Because only God can forgive sins. So so Jesus has given a couple of authorities and the Holy Spirit. So he said, as my Father has sent me, I send you. And Jesus is also the high priest according to a lineage of Melchizedek, a new line of priesthood, not the uh, from uh, Levites. Uh, and then uh, he said, he breathes unto them, it says, receive the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is the, th the third person of the, of the divinity, of the Godhead. So they have him. And then he gives them a second authority. He says, if you forgive the sins of Vanny, they shall be forgiven. So that's a, a second authority. So they have two authorities from Jesus plus the Holy Spirit, which is God, because only God can forgive sins. So if Jesus hadn't given them the Holy Spirit, they would not have been able to do it. Thank you. So that concludes our question and answer session. And now we will have concluding statements from each speaker. Dr. Shabir Ali will go first. So I would like to conclude with uh, something I said previously. The objective of uh, today's uh, dialogue as I see it is so that we should get to know each other better. The Quran says that you may uh, come to know each other. And often uh, Muslims and Christians misunderstand each other, misunderstand what each other believes. And here we have had today the opportunity to hear from the proponents of each side, a capable speaker representing Muslims and a capable speaker representing Christians to explain to us their beliefs firsthand. I think this is progress. Uh, the world is racked with violence and terrorism and uh, uh, hatred uh, between people. Uh, but uh, we have started today to bring people together in, in, as brothers and sisters in faith, uh, in the faith uh, in one God, in monotheism, though we express that monotheism in different ways. Uh, we believe that there is Satan, and Satan tempts us towards evil, and Muslims and Christians together want to avoid evil and do what is right. So in what we have heard today, we have a mutual commitment as Muslims and Christians to do what is right, to follow what is good and wholesome, and to reject, to reject uh, falsehood and error. From the Quranic perspective, I've tried to emphasize that monotheism is one of the most important concepts, and this seems to me one of the most fundamental uh, aspects of uh, religion. Uh, if we're going to ask from the get-go, is there a God? Uh, naturally, we have in mind either there is a God or there isn't a God. And just saying a God means that in our minds, instinctively, we're thinking, if at all God exists, there is one God. And so, too, we find that the philosophical arguments for the existence of God usually point to there being one God, not the plurality of gods. And so the Muslim declaration that there is only one God fits with the basic human instinct and also uh, corresponds to the philosophical arguments for the existence of God. I've also tried to stress uh, and explain that the Muslim conception of sin and forgiveness is such that in our understanding, there is the all-powerful and all-merciful God to whom we direct our prayers and from whom we seek forgiveness. So we will sin, that's human nature. Uh, but we were already taught by uh, the original lesson that Adam and Eve experienced uh, that when we sin, God is willing to forgive us. We have to turn back to God and seek his forgiveness and God will forgive us. And so we maintain in Islam the two uh, twin teachings of monotheism and 
praying only to God for our forgiveness. Uh, I want to thank Joe for uh, his uh, generosity in offering his time to come and explain uh, to this mostly Muslim audience uh, what Christians believe in. And uh, I'm so glad uh, for Christians who are here, Stephen and others who have come out to share uh, this uh, moment with us, a moment uh, and an evening, uh, afternoon of learning and growing together in faith. And I hope that we'll have such uh, events again in the future and we will continue uh, to be enlightened uh, by these very interesting uh, mutual discussions. Thank you again, and if I said anything wrong or in the wrong way, please forgive me. And uh, we ask God to forgive all of us and to guide us uh, to that which uh, will please him in this life and in the life hereafter. Thank you all. Assalamu alaikum. So Joe will be making his concluding statement. Well, I'd like to thank all of you here today uh, for taking, like uh, uh, Mr. Shabir said, a time out to deepen our understanding of who God is. And um, as I said, uh, we don't even understand who we are. And uh, the point I like to make, I like to speak in simple analogies. I don't even know who I am. Uh, you know, the fact that is I am one, but I seem to be two in one, and there's a unity and a plurality at the same time. Uh, I also like to mention that uh, God appeared to Moses as a burning bush. You know, why a bush? Uh, it could have been a tree. There is a plurality in this bush uh, that I wanted to mention. Uh, only he knows why, but, you know, we can ponder it. And also, I'd like to present that the fact is, some of the fact is that the deceiver is with us. And as I pointed out, at least from the uh, Torah, that out of four things he said, all four were true. And why did he lie? To kill us. And uh, so we have to double check everything that we do, because uh, the way I understand it, that uh, God had to clothe Adam with skin. Uh, in order for me to wear, I have a, a, my shoes are made of leather. Somebody was wearing my shoe be, shoes before me, who? An animal. So in order for me to wear these shoes, oh, they're at the front, uh, some, an animal had to die. And so symbolically here behind the scene, because God speaks little, but says a lot. And so we have to really take the time at every little word he uses. So he clothed them with skin to cover their nakedness. Now, nakedness is like when I sin, I can cover myself in front of God with my clothes, but he's like x-ray vision. He sees through me. He sees my sin. So how on earth can I cover myself? So God had to do, he had to kill the animal. That was actually the first sacrifice to cover for the sins of, of his sin. And he, and he, was, he couldn't be in the in the tabernacle. So as I said, the center of the garden is actually a sanctuary where God is. Uh, and it, uh, Adam's role was to be a priest. He was a priest to, to, to guard that, to, to give his life to guard that temple and to give his life for the wife, which he failed. He let Satan enter. And so he failed the test. And God had to kill an animal, shed his blood to pay, to cover, at least a covering for Adam for his sins. But the devil will say to you, oh, don't worry, you can sin, you'll be forgiven. Now, I've been to a, a conference where an ex-Satanist was there. He was what they call a wizard. Well, he was one of the top ten wizards in the world. I uh, forgot his name, King, something King. I forget his first name. And uh, they used to do, uh, if you wanted something from God, you had to give something. And usually they used to do abortions. He, he participated in 121 abortions. And um, they used to break into the Catholic Church and, to and take the consecrated host, which I cannot present here because it's too complex, who is actually Jesus, veiled. And he said, if you put ten in front of me and one was consecrated, I would tell you which one was the consecrated one because we feel a hatred for him. They will pay up $25,000 for one. And they do the what they call black masses. So he said... 
because we have division in our own churches. We have the Catholics, but we have the Protestants, and the Protestants don't believe in it. Can, if you can imagine this. So they actually, I believe that they themselves have been deceived by this deceiver to say, no, no, it's not really Jesus. It's only bread symbol. You know, it's only a symbol. But for them, the Satanists, so Satan believes in the real presence, but he wants you to believe, no, it isn't. And so therefore, if, if we sin, he said, why go to a priest and confess your sins? Because we Catholic go to a priest to confess our sins. But the Protestants said, no, I just go to God and say, God, forgive me. Of course, because Satan, he, if you don't forgive your sins properly, you end up in his kingdom. And that's what he wants, to go into his kingdom. He doesn't want you to have the real body and blood to strengthen you. Because if you do, then he can't fight you as easily. And so therefore, be very careful these small few deceptions confession thank you so much god bless you god be blessed i'd like to thank everyone for coming out today i know i can see like a lot of empty chairs today and there were more muslims than christians in today's event hopefully in our next event there will be more Christian audience, I hope so. <laughs> and so I also want to thank the online viewers who are uh, tuning in via our live internet broadcast, and also our speakers who have taken time out of their busy schedule and prepared and attended today's event. Um, I'd also like to thank the Dawa Center team, all the dedicated uh, volunteer brothers and sisters who have helped set up this event, and the catering team, uh, which reminds me, we do have refreshments.